And we are almost live. It's, it's, it's there, we're live, <laughs> officially live. All right, welcome everyone to another episode of CorinCon Continuing Content or CorinCon Cubed. Um, I am your host, Virginia McLean. We're back today with a super awesome surprise presentation um, because scheduling was, was finicky, but um, I'm so excited to introduce y'all to um, Duncan Swan and Hugh Howie, both of whom I feel like I hardly need any, any introduction to begin with, but you know, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them anyway. Um, so y'all, uh, we'll start with Duncan, uh, who is uh, an organizational mastermind. Um, that is <laughs> how I know him uh, currently. And um, he's also an author of, uh, of an awesome, like grim sci-fi book called Monstre. Is that the correct pronunciation? That is correct. It's, it's, French. All right. it's French for monster. That's exactly yeah. what it's meant to be. All right. So fancy. So, so fancy, so fancy right? Hurry up with so my fancy. croissant. That's what I was basically <laughs> going for. So Monstre is the book and, um, and also has a, a very interesting past in finance and acting and a few other things that we'll get into. <laughs> I, did, I did poke around your social media a bit. So interesting, I, yeah. interesting. Um, and of course, we also have Hugh Howie, who, I mean, you know, it's not nearly as big of a deal, but um, <laughs> just kidding. I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah. I'm um, trying to get my acting career going. Yes. Please, that'd be amazing. Uh, but uh, I'm sure you all are familiar um, with Hugh Howie, but just in case you're not, um, he's the author of the massively successful Silo series um, and also the Sand Books and also Mollified and a bunch of other stuff that I can't even keep track of because um, Hugh used to write a lot and is maybe getting back into it, but um, took a break for a while. Um, you may also know him as that random dude who was sailing around the world for a while um, and posting a lot of pictures on the internet because that's also a thing he did. So, um, <laughs> my favorite however pictures, you know him, we my are favorite very... pictures of Hugh is, is him at Burning Man. Those are my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> I hope those are on the internet. There are some epic pictures of Hugh on social media uh, all over the place. So uh, I'm so delighted to have both of you here. Thank you so much um, for, for joining me. And the main thing we're here to talk about today, weirdly, isn't even both of your amazing uh, catalogs of books. It is, in fact, something else altogether, which is um, SPSFC, which I think you and I just decided is officially going to be called Space Fic. <laughs> I, well, you two kind of decided it. Now I can't stop hearing it. Um, Sorry. I can't remember. I Duncan, how did we say it before? I thought we had. I, the only one that I bounced around, and I mean, I, I had Space Force, but that's that, that was separate. Space but yeah, it's like. Space, I, space yeah, but our thing might be bigger than their thing. So if we use it yeah. and, own, and own it, then when people talk about Space Wars, they'll think they're like, you talk about that competition? We just like, need, no, yeah, no, we need we need about. a uniform and a patch. And yeah, we and have everything. a patch. Yeah, exactly. We just need the uniform. I'm done with Space Wars. Yeah. Show this on. And Spiffo has <laughs> got a decent ring. We couldn't come up with a Spiffo sci-fi version that didn't sound like we were having a strong. So Space, <laughs> space Force, Space Pick. Uh, space Fic is probably a little bit more on brand, isn't it? Yeah, I like Space Fic. Hmm. But I, I also suggested that we have two, uh, like you always say it one way and I'll always say it some other way and people have to choose their side and it'll eventually be like GIF and GIF. It's, and the, the people arguing about this 30 years from now will actually unearth this video and say, guys, it was actually a prank. Like we've been fighting about this for 30 years and yeah, here's a video proof. That that there, were, there is no right way. Yeah, they, yeah. they were making it up the whole as it went along the whole time, which no one can, should be able to tell by now. <laughs> um, the secret behind the curtain is that we're all just making it up. Mm -hmm. um, so for those people who are watching at home um, that like maybe haven't heard of this competition at all, um, but they've heard of you and they're here because they thought that was cool. What do you want folks to know? What are the primary things you'd like to tell people about Space Fic? I'm going for it. I've decided I'm Camp Space Fic, so I'm, I'm in. Um, uh, I did send anymore? you questions. Yeah, well, the, 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 main thing, the main thing I want people to know about, they might not even hear about it related to uh, the competition to Space Fic. They'll actually might just hear uh, of a book being reviewed by someone that they... 
uh, trust or a review that blows them away and makes them go pick up a book they wouldn't have otherwise. So if they never even uh, link the competition to the reason they just read a book they loved, I don't really care about that. I think the people who will know about the competition, they will really care about it are the authors who are going to get their book read by a trusted reviewer, going to get a review up on a website, possibly become a finalist or a, or a winner, go home with a ray gun like this. That's like yeah. solid metal and heavy as all get out <laughs> on this special tray where their plaque will have their name on it. Um, so I think the people who are participating in it uh, are super excited about it. But I don't, I don't mind if it's invisible to readers, uh, if, if they're just, if we have, you know, 150 or 100 reviews out there in the ether that are going to help uh, searchability for these authors, um, increase readership, like uh, the best, the best things that will happen on this will probably be invisible. But mm -hmm. I know I had a really hard time getting people to read my books when I was first self-publishing. And, and certainly and it can competitions. So this is an opportunity, I think, for a lot of uh, up and coming writers that that's greatly needed. Totally. Um, I mean, SPFBO, the, our fantasy uh, sister competition, is um, definitely huge for for bringing in readers. Um, I was a, a Blades Edge was a finalist, a book of mine um, back in. 2019 oh, and it was awesome. a massive difference in sales just being in the competition and being a finalist um let alone winning or whatever but i think that as a reader honestly i look to spfbo to help find books and i actually seek out books that are entered in the competition even if they haven't done well particularly because i know how much uh comes down to subject subjective reader preference for that um and so um, I think actually that it wouldn't hurt to attract readers to the competition as it's happening, um, just to, to yeah, participate. Yeah, we'll a lot of people in those forums. I think yeah. what we're looking at is like the the, the long tail kind of mm. uh, appeal. Um, I mean, anecdotally, and this is where it's specific Space Force uh, came from, is that I was seeing a lot of reviewers who I'd started following uh, leading up to my own release, et cetera, who were posting reviews of books that weren't on my radar whatsoever. Um, and, you know, judging book by cover kind of thing, a few of them caught my eye and I went digging and that's how I found Spit Bow. Um, <laughs> and it's because of that, you know, that, that heightened awareness, that, that word of mouth and the, I guess you could say the focus that those books were getting. And I wasn't, wouldn't have been exposed to them otherwise. And I found some amazing reads and some lovely authors that I'm now both following and also interacting with um, purely as, as a result of that competition and not necessarily following the competition. I'm, I'm not a fantasy writer. I love fantasy, but I'm not a fantasy writer and wouldn't have entered into it. Um, and, you know, clearly didn't know anything about it, but I was seeing all those books pop up. And in, in part, that's where specific came from. But I think, yeah, the long tail is what we want to kind of just get the word out and kind of build this up over time and um, appeal to readers that wouldn't necessarily see a book if it's not in a bookstore or from via Big Five or isn't getting a big marketing campaign or already being turned into a movie, um, which seems to be you know the the, the standard format for uh, your paperback novel that you go buy and sit on the beach with. It's it's been through quite a long process and we're kind of trying to create another route for that. Yeah, awesome. So um, I know that. The SPFBO, the fantasy version, has been around for, this is its seventh year, mm. and people have been clamoring for a sci-fi version of this contest for a while. And did you hear the call or independently think this is a thing we should do and then happened to meet that need? I, I, I heard the call from Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, yeah, this is like, the, like inside uh, he... yeah, it's the inside <laughs> joke with you and myself in that. I, I saw SPFBO in the sixth year I keep talking about myself for a second before I published and I was like wow this looks like an absolutely amazing concept I love who's involved uh, I, I wasn't sure if it was the brainchild of Mark Lawrence or if somebody approached them once upon a time as well and said can you please you know put your hand up and help us with this but um, the pedigree seemed great and the results were amazing and the, the content and the quality that was coming out of it was jaw dropping in some aspects so I was like that sounds like a lovely idea but obviously as I kind of mentioned earlier I don't write fantasy um, and so I started poking around. I was like, is there a sci-fi version? And I, I got the short answer that no, there isn't. Um, uh, but you're welcome to kind of create one if you wanted. And I was like, that's not going to work. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I don't have a book out. 
I don't necessarily feel like creating competition for myself. <laughs> I, I literally just don't have the star power to get it off the ground. So I left it and then last year again or something, this year. Because uh, the seventh round is picking off and I got contact with one of the authors and Mark Lawrence was like, do you know of a sci-fi version again? Um, and, and long story short, no, there wasn't one. One of the authors put his hand up, but also said, I'm, I'm not a big enough weight to kind of maybe perhaps get this off the ground, at which point I just said, well, I've been following Hugh forever. I love what he's done. Um, he would be the perfect face for this, but also the perfect personality and possibly person to be involved. The question is, can I convince him? <laughs> um, and then I just shamed him in social media and said, you know, would you want to run with this? And he happily said yes. I, I just said yes before you explained what it was. You're no, like, I know. Well, that's that's I was like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. I'm busy. I, I thought, don't know any. I, don't I thought know we were going like on a surfing more trip to Bali for two weeks or something. I had no idea what you had. Mm. So no, it, it but this of, is also fun. Yeah, it, kind of just, it kind of it it needed to happen. I couldn't find an alternative. I wanted one that was like this. Hmm. And you know, a field of dreams. We've ended up creating it ourselves, which which has helped. I mean, it's it's now got its own kind of impetus behind it and we've got a bit of, bit of a following and the reviewers on board so yeah it's now it, it's something that i wanted to enter and now can't but <laughs> no uh, yeah i i don't get i don't whatever. get your strategy here you create a competition that you uh, can't I'm, I'm going for that long but tail it's kind of that's right it's eventually everyone will buy duncan's book just out of support for him having created the contest and so yeah, yeah. It's, also, <laughs> it's also sour grapes you can always say like yeah i probably would have won again this year but i'm not allowed to enter so like you can just assume I would have won if I could have entered. Hmm. Yeah. No, we were yeah. It's we were joking about putting it in under, under a, a pen name, but I'm like, I'm not gonna. <laughs> you know, it's, that's just the wrong message to send. From I entered. I entered two books. You entered two books. You... Yeah, under different names. I leave it to <laughs> readers to figure out which two. <laughs> my my life is Hugh Howie. If I were Hugh Howie, yeah. Or exactly. If I did it, there we go. If I did, if I did. OJ Simpson homage. If I did it. Um, that, uh, I don't know if you're joking or serious, Hugh, because that would be hilarious. I'm I joking. Okay. I, <laughs> I assumed you were joking, but I was like, I I'd don't be know terrified. You... I don't, I, I, I'm, I admire people that go into competitions like this. I'd be terrified to put any of my works up against, uh, but the, the 300 other writers, it's incredible. But, uh, mm. um, you know, I, when I, uh, book bloggers have a lot to do with my, uh, like whatever happened with my career, I got like a, a big jump start by publishing in the era of book bloggers. And mm. they're still out there. They're still super popular, but they're doing it on all these other mediums and and, right. um, and these established uh, um, uh, social media platforms, like a lot of YouTube, a lot of TikTok and stuff like that. Um, but when back in 2008, 2009, when I was getting my start, blogs were still a big deal. People went to people's blogs and read them. And uh, I sent like co copies of my first book to so many bloggers and just begging them to give it a chance. And I, I remember what that feeling was like having a book you believed in. And you know that if readers, if enough readers read it, some portion of them are going to really enjoy it. But how do you get them to read it? It's the most frustrating feeling in the world as a writer. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I got really lucky. I had a few book bloggers, like give it the first chapter chance in the book, um, got them to carry through and, and got rave reviews. And I use those reviews on my Amazon page, on uh, all the promotional stuff that I would take around to book signings. Right. Um, and I really, really feel indebted to the blogging community. And so that's, that's what I tap into when I think about um, this competition is like getting more authors to have that chance and have that feeling of like at least someone uh, at least it's not going unread that's just a terrible feeling when you write something it, but it's also not being read by just someone it's being read by I mean we've got we've got some lovely reviewers who are like this is short of being a career it's almost like their second career like this is they devote a lot of personal time effort energy and money um to produce as good a, a review product if i can even call it that uh, so you're getting well not getting but anybody who enters is is potentially being read by um, the, the the famous reviewers that currently kind of are putting out work and content and, and promoting self-publishing so it's and not even just self-publishing i mean these reviewers read everything but they've taken their yeah. time to get involved in a self-published competition 
Um, and for somebody who recently went through the process of trying to get reviewers to read my book, like that's a daunting thing. So you, you, you said as well, it's a daunting, daunting process and task. And, yeah. um, you know, you can really believe in your book, but if nobody reads it, it's, it's kind of dead on arrival. Yeah. Um, and it's so. hard too, because asking doesn't always help, right? Like reviewers get so many reviewers. Well, that's requests. it, requests. Yeah, I don't know how people, right. I, I don't know how reviewers Infinite. fit it in. Yeah, the, the amount yeah. of requests and books and arcs that they must get bombarded with. I mean, there's, there's multiple platforms as well. NetGalley being one, like reviewers are yeah. going to request books on NetGalley. So it's, you're competing yeah. for time. Yep. And as generally as an unknown, which a lot of us are when we start out, obviously, like you're, 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 you're definitely behind the priority queue in terms of possibly getting on the on the to be read list of that day or that week or that month. So yeah, I when I when I wrote my first book and you know had printed copies, I remember thinking like the world was waiting on it. Like there weren't enough books being written, and uh, this filled a, a unique niche, and everyone else is just sitting around like, well, gosh, I don't know what to read. And when I started uh, reviewing books uh, for a friend of mine's website. Uh, doing like mystery and crime and thriller books. Uh, we did a few interviews and reviews of big name authors. Next thing I know, I was getting like 20 books a week in the mail, uh, you know, uh, advanced release copies and brand new releases and some backlist stuff. And I started getting, I was drowning in books. And that's when I was realized like how it, the money is not the issue. It's the time. Right. Mm. Like there's just, yep. uh, if you send me uh, a song to listen to, Sure, three, five right. minutes out of my day, I'll listen to the song. If you send me some art to look at, you know, I can look at it for a few minutes and I've looked at your art. Uh, even a movie, um, you know, or a TV show might take an hour, two hours out of a day, but like a book is another book that I don't get to read. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's that's where great reviews and competitions where you have finalists and winners really come into play because everyone's looking for an excuse to winnow their reading yeah. list down. Right. And um, that's... It's such a hard reality as a writer when you think uh, you know, like your book is filling uh, a much needed void and then you realize it's actually just a drop in a deluge. And uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to, to grasp as you're starting your writing career. Totally. Um, and it's super frustrating. And so that's why competitions like this are so, so useful. Um, so I want to move us on to, to ridiculousness for a little bit and give everyone who's watching a chance to write in questions. We've got a number of people in the chat already. Um, a lot of people saying thank you for organizing this um, and a lot of people agreeing that you can drown in review requests and TBRs. Um, and so um, all of that is great, but folks who are watching, please, please, please feel free to throw questions in there that we will throw at Hugh and Duncan uh, later on. Um, and I'm gonna move us into the sort of standard core and con irreverent section where we find out more about you both personally and talk about some oh. weird random stuff that um, is only knowable through uh, stalking you on the internet. So <laughs> um, I'm gonna start off with uh, Duncan, you were an extra in oh, the yeah, gods yeah. of Egypt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that was, that was, that was a music but, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just, you know, like hanging out um, on a giant movie set with a bunch of uh, famous people and also a bunch of really not famous people because that's what being an extra is like. Bunch but the really, the really important question that I want to ask is, how are the snacks? You mean like the- um, Crafty. The craft uh, services table? Craft services, how was crafty? Was it any good? To he be, doesn't remember, he didn't eat. To be honest, I don't remember. I don't know if they fed us. <laughs> I'm on, that's, that's a good. They uh -oh. must have. Time they to must call have the fed us, or I had to bring stuff with me, but I honestly don't remember anything about the food whatsoever. <laughs> um, you were too no. busy wearing donning armor. And no, no, the, the, the more interesting thing was literally just being on a, on a, on a green stage. Slash, there was an entire hangar that was literally a green stage, and yeah. there was no set whatsoever. Everything was just blue blocks and arranged for spacing and tape marking on the floors and the being costume and the amount of spray tan that I had to wear. Those are like my, my three takeaways. Like, and then doing how much? How much spray tan did you have to wear? Like layers upon layers. Uh, layers upon layers upon layers upon layers, and it would spray us every single day. Um, to the point where I, I don't have a comparison. I was. 
I, like I've been living in the sun my entire life and I've never seen sunscreen ever. I, it, they wanted, obviously, because it's right. Egyptian, but it, the, the, the source material for the extras was Australia and there's not many Egyptians running around Australia. So. Right. Yeah, we were just doused in spray tan. So I don't think my bedding lasted very long. I had to get chucked. But yeah, we had experienced that one. That was yeah. long days. How did you well, wind up as a, how, did, how did you land that gig? Um, hmm. So this is when I was working in finance for a long time. And then they came to a point in my life where I was like, okay, I, I, I saw a sign and I pulled the pin and I basically said, I'm out. Uh, and I took off took nine months to 10 months off to basically really start writing Monster Ray heavily and editing like a joint writing group. I just went all in at that point. I had a nice bunch of savings and I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll live off this and finish the book. Um, and so I had all this extra free time and I had done other somewhat related work and they, my name popped up and I said, would you also be interested in doing this? I'm like, sure, why not? Pay was decent for literally doing nothing. All I was doing was writing at the time um, the only caveat was it was 13 hour long days, at which point they might only need you for four shots in total, okay. maybe an hour on set, and the rest of you are waiting. So it's not being an extra is not glamorous. It's not necessarily you could, you could do your writing while you're on set waiting, right? You couldn't take any devices with you. You can't take phones with you. Oh, that's lame. Yeah. So it's literally <laughs> you're in costume just waiting. And we were basically not mostly waiting outside on the sound stage. Could and you then, read a book, like a physical book? You couldn't take anything with you except your costume. You can play like you can play mental chess with other people. Most, like most people just slept. We honestly, we all just lay on the ground and slept. So that's probably mm -hmm. one of the photos you saw. We just it yeah. Was so, I was like, oh goodness, I still think in degrees because <laughs> metric is the way. Um, I want to say nineties. It was in the high nineties. What did you say that with with Celsius? Because I actually I can do both. I got my brain. Uh, was it thirty? I wanted, I wanted, I wanted it in Kelvin. It ranged only, between only Kelvin in this, yeah. this interview. <laughs> Absolute zero. Um, it ranges between like 33 Celsius and 40 on a hot day, and you're in you know really tight leather. Can we agree that that Celsius makes a lot of? I'm a I'm a huge fan of the metric system. Celsius makes a lot of sense in doing experiments and and things like that. But Fahrenheit makes so much more sense. When we're talking about human uh, things, our bodies, and our comfort level, right? Because like the difference between like 28 and 35 is just enormous. But Fahrenheit, <laughs> Fahrenheit gives you the space of like the difference yeah. between 75 and 80 is, is, is significant. You need all those little. Yeah, but I never mm -hmm. know, do I need a jumper? Or like, like zero is zero is really cold in uh, Fahrenheit and hundred is really hot. And we live kind of in between those extremes and like 30 away from hundred around, around 70 is like, uh, typical comfort level for a lot of people and 30 above zero is where water starts freezing and snows happens. It's just like life happens in Fahrenheit and science happens in Celsius. And that should be the end of the discussion and no one should bring it up again. <laughs> I actually think out of all the things like metric wins hands down at everything. I think the only place where it, it is somewhat arbitrary is, is, is Fahrenheit and Celsius where it's like Celsius it's yeah, terrible. it makes sense. Like One, it does make sense for like if we're just talking about the freezing and boiling points of water. Yeah. But isn't Fahrenheit based off of the the freezing point of seawater, which is which yeah. is very relevant to sailing, right? Like but yeah, but who who cares about that one? Who cares that like <laughs> like I twenty nine? I'm wearing a sweater and thirty. I'm 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 wearing a bathing suit or something like that. It's just like <laughs> there's just too much there's too much change with every degree of Celsius. I have to say that living in a place that goes down to minus 40, which is the same in both, by the way, um, uh, that it feels like Fahrenheit, I feel like covers talking about outdoor comfort more comprehensively. Absolutely. But, um, but I, you know, you get used to anything. And I think once, once you're used to talking about what the temperature is like in Celsius, it, it actually seems reasonable. But I feel like you should be, we should be talking about half degrees, like partial degrees for Celsius if we wanted to get the same nuance. It's like, oh, well, it's, it's 26.3 right now instead yeah. of, you know, like it's, um, instead of just talking about 26, 27. Well, we um, really did okay. go off the rails there. <laughs> it's okay. It's all my fault. Pretty standard core and con. And also, um, you know, we're talking about a sci-fi show. So obviously it's relevant to talk about our sci-fi show, sci-fi competition. 
Um, so obviously measurements are relevant. Okay, so we, we talked a little bit about Duncan's acting career. Um, Hugh, I wanna ask you, um, as a longtime follower of your social media, um, I, I have to ask a very important question um, that I'm sure you know the answer to. Approximately how many shirtless slash naked selfies have you posted to the internet, would you say? Oh my gosh. Well, I, I like to point out that I've been fully uh, clothed, mostly in pajamas for the last uh, year and a half, two years during the uh, pandemic. Um, I'm wearing pants right now. Uh, what? Um, yeah, so I- <laughs> Are you feeling people, okay? I, I, <laughs> like I, I lived on boats for most of my adult life and, and uh, it's, a, it's a bunch of nudists who live on boats, mostly because um, every time you wear something, you have to think about washing it at some point. And- you can't wash things in seawater. So it's just easier not to put things on. Um, so yeah, uh, if any selfies I upload, it's not like I took my shirt off to take a selfie. Like often, if you saw me wearing a <laughs> shirt, it's like I went out of my way to not uh, annoy you with another shirtless selfie. I'm like, okay, let me go find a shirt before we do this. Um, so yeah, I just lived pretty much naked for uh, quite a few years there. Um, the first music festival I ever went to, I only went because I was wanted to spend more time with some friends, and they had a they had a free ticket because they had a they were a speakers. So they had this RV with extra space in it. And they're like, just come tag along, and uh, I showed up with exactly what I have on now, like cargo shorts and t-shirts, and all my friends were like, you can't like you're at a music festival. It's like kind of a Burning Man thing. Yeah, like, yeah. You, you're gonna look you're gonna look weird looking normal. You need to look more weirder to fit in. And I was like, okay. And I didn't bring anything. So they had these little silver shorts. They brought everyone a pair so we could have like a group photo. And they were like square cut speedos, basically. They were just silver metallic. And I was like, that's what I, I just come off the boat. Left, like left my boat in New Zealand or Australia or someplace, mm. came back to Vegas for this thing. And uh, I was like, that, that was my tan line at the point. It was like these square <laughs> briefs so i was like cool i'll wear those the whole time so go. i put those on i was just wearing them like day and night and all the uh all the i had no idea about these music festivals i was so clueless i was lost like uh but everyone's come up to me like i was so hardcore because i because i had the tan that like looked like i just lived at music festivals and i was wearing these yeah, yeah, yeah. The tiny <laughs> little briefs like it was no big deal because that was my whole life Did you have people like was that did you have the glow sticks? No, we, so glow sticks are, you know, I've learned that you don't do glow sticks anymore. It's too bad for the environment. Now it's all uh, LEDs. It's those life finger so, things, isn't it? Yeah, it's anything that's rechargeable. So I sound know. so old. I'm not that old. Yeah. Um, Jeez, kids. There's a name for like glow sticks or something. That's called like Goop or, or something. No, it's called Moop. Um, Moop, yeah, yeah. Matter out of place. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to create more Moop. Um, but yeah, so that's... Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm comfortable being naked because I am used to being uh, around. Naked. Yeah, used to be naked. <laughs> Excellent. It's pretty, it's pretty um, and that wasn't meant to be a dig, by the way. Like, I, you know, there's far be it from me to stop anyone from posting shirtless selfies on, on the well, internet. I, I suppose it's good. I, I don't want people thinking it's like me thinking that I'm like worth seeing with my clothes off. I did not <laughs> think that at all, I'm especially so post pandemic. Short, yeah, so short, short might be the right word. I'm, <laughs> Um, all right. So uh, at least we've, we've covered that. I think the point is that every, the takeaway for everyone is that you like lives on a boat most of the time. <laughs> so hence nudity. I think that makes perfect sense to me, but I've also spent a lot of time on boats. So um, all right. Uh, next up, we're going to move on away from from random internet things, um, and instead talk a little bit about um, y'all's uh, careers before we we're gonna we will swing back to Spacefic, but um, uh, I'm back to Spacefic. You're back way. to Spacefic. Okay, wow. yeah. I'm calling it Spacefic though. I've officially I heard those in my camp. I think we have three things now. We have Space Force, Spacefic, and Spacefic, and this is the origin of the three camps of uh, pronunciation people like, have right. to we can just choose, attribute them there's the virginia team. camp there's the duncan camp or the duncan camp and there's the hugh camp yeah okay all right choose your choose your sides everyone and prepare for battle <laughs> um i expect everyone in the comments to to chime in about how you've chosen your 
official pronunciation of space pick. All right. Uh, so That's cheating. You're, you're, <laughs> you're planting it in their minds. It sounds like we need a poll. I got to say something. Sorry, your official pronunciation of SPSFC. <laughs> there. Jeez. Now I haven't biased anyone. Space pick. Okay. Um, so let's talk just a little bit more about y'all personally. Um, Duncan, you ran a successful Kickstarter to launch Monstre. And because we're here to talk about a self-publishing competition mm -hmm. and Kickstarter can be a massively useful tool to mm -hmm. people who mm -hmm. want to self-publish, mm -hmm. I would like you to talk a little bit more about that. Um, oh, how did it go? What kinds of rewards did you offer? Um, and, and yeah, let's like, let's talk a little bit about, had, did you have any prior experience with Kickstarter? No, no, I didn't even have an account. I'd never backed a Kickstarter before either, which actually helps. So if you want to run your own Kickstarter, it does help to back another Kickstarter because it, it, it increases your ranking in some algorithm basis. Yeah. Uh, but no, I had never done one before. Um, and I was looking at ways basically to kind of get a bunch of arcs printed. And if anybody's trying to get a book printed, that's expensive. If you want to get a few printed, it's even more expensive, obviously. Um, so we were looking at, around, uh, at pathways, either self-fund, which we had already self-funded quite a lot, or try find you know, some kind of crowdsourcing uh, format and Kickstarter. I can't remember if I saw another book on Kickstarter and that jogged the idea that I could at least give that a go, but um, I think we set a goal for 10,000. I, I got a quote for, I think the quote was 9,000 for like 750 books or something. And then, in, you know, accounting for tax and accounting for postage, which a lot of people forget to do. <laughs> um, so bake that into your calculation if you ever want to do a Kickstarter because you will bankrupt yourself, especially if you open <laughs> it to international deliveries. So anyway, mm -hmm. we set a target, I think of nine or so, capped it at 10. And then uh, generally speaking, Kickstarter runs for about a month. Um, and we funded in four days. So I did not, Nine. yeah, I didn't expect that A, because I, I had no social media following whatsoever. Nobody knew who I was. I didn't have a backlog of books, um, but I did manage to have uh, a post on Imgur. So I, I dabbled in Imgur occasionally and I had a post that went viral and that I'd almost okay. say funded half of the project. Wow. Um, Cool. So the only, yeah, the, the, the takeaway I could say is Kickstarter is an amazing, amazing format to use. Yeah. Um, but you can't rely on Kickstarter alone. You still need to try, get the word out elsewhere to draw attention to your Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of, of, of funding, uh, the process is easy. It's straightforward. You yeah. need to set your tiers for your rewards. It helps to have an Excel sheet so your math adds up at the end. Um, <laughs> True. And then it also helps in terms of anybody who is backing projects on Kickstarter tends to be a serial backer in that they're, they're looking for new content and they're the kind of person who wants to help fund creative outlets. I don't yeah. know why. Like, I'm, it's, it's interesting to me that that larger uh, population group interest body exists that they'll actively go out and fund. And have, you never, add, have you never gotten kind of hooked on Kickstarter? No, I love I'm, I've, I think I, I so I've got I've done it. I've got a lot of friends who I, are scared of getting on Kickstarter because they know they're going to back twenty things, and it's the fun. It's the helping out more than it is the product because then all the stuff shows up and they're like, I don't know where to put all this stuff. And yeah. like I, but I wanted someone. I wanted to help someone get it made. So I I've gotten a little like um, sometimes I'll donate without even like wanting a reward or something. You can just give uh, yeah. X amount of of dollars or something so it's it's you, you felt it from the other side but there's yeah. like a whole community of people well, out I, yeah i started back a few afterwards well yeah it afterwards is. i was like oh this is actually really nice and i really like now i understand the format of why it appeals yeah so i've gotten a few deliveries um, <laughs> but yeah before that it's, before it's so that nice one, to just be like oh look at this cool artistic project i want this thing to exist and oh my goodness i can actually help like mm -hmm. i think it's that it's so infrequent that you can do that like I want this creative endeavor to succeed. And like, how often do you ever get to, you know, help out with that? Cause if it's not your project, then, so I, I think that's one of the appeals of it. Sorry. Yeah, and, no, in the same breath as well, then whoever does back your project is already, is already emotionally invested. Like you've already got a supporter, technically speaking, before they've even received your product. Um, and for some reason they're, not for some reason, but there, I still get emails from Kickstarter backers. Like they're loyal long-term and they're like, when are you doing your next Kickstarter? Yep. Um, 
So yeah, it gets like it's a really great community to tap into. Really nice, kind of usable, easy to understand interface and format. Um, and yeah, funding wise, like if you if you nail your marketing campaign on the side, like you need to get your word up. But if you nail that, like it's it it really opens doors. So yeah. I'm very glad that I did it and I can't wait to do the second one um, because it does let you do a lot of stuff that, uh, that otherwise you wouldn't in terms of your you know, rewards. You know, if you increase yeah. the, the goal that you're going for, you can offer nicer rewards that go in, go in conjunction with, what, with whatever your prime product is. Yeah. So I had, I had, I don't, I think I'm actually. Do you not have your book? No, I have the book, but I had a whole bunch of other stuff. I'm trying to work out if I've got any left. I think it'd be like, uh, uh, I had a nice, really nice mouse pad, like a big oh, yeah. fat, fat mouse pad done with one of the concept art thing pieces that I, I had done. And then I had a big uh, poster with one of the other concept art pieces, um, a bunch of bookmarks made from poster art that I had another artist make. And then I, I stole an idea from you and I do have these left over. Um, you did a wool, one of your little YouTube video reveal things where you had a USB card that flipped. Yeah. Wool. Well, Brandon, I was like, that's a nice idea, but how yeah, do I do hot. Yeah, how do I do for Monstre? <laughs> so I went and I went and did some Googling. I was like, oh, I can get a little a bullet. Bu it's a bullet, but this is what you like. Ooh, it's a bullet USB. That's cool. So it's like a nice 32 <laughs> gigs. So, yeah. And these, those, there's like sold like absolute hotcakes. So I kept Amazing. one for myself. Um, but yeah, it's like you can get really inventive and creative in terms of you know trying to offer rewards that are on brand yeah. of whatever your book product piece of art movie is um yeah. and yeah that seems to get more interest than your general product sometimes yeah. it really yeah thing. i had so many people who just ordered artwork when i <laughs> when i ran a kickstarter that <laughs> was just like which and the artwork was gorgeous so i don't mm. blame them right but <clears throat> um but yeah prints prints art prints are very popular um mm. So uh, a reminder while, while Duncan's searching for his book um, <laughs> that if you do run a Kickstarter, just recognize it's a ton of actual hours of work to manage the whole thing and to fulfill all the uh, rewards afterwards. Just signing them. Plan them. How? One signing. of the worst things that can happen is to have a super successful Kickstarter. Um, yeah. There's like a range where it's comfortable for it to, to do well, but like I've got a friend who uh, did a book that did really, really well and managing uh, all the rewards that were promised and everything was like um, Full -time difficult. Job. Yeah. Yeah. You should have seen There are a lot of people was... who hire someone. If you have a successful enough Kickstarter, you wind up having to just give a chunk of that money to someone to. Yeah. They're, they're to fulfillment, the yeah fulfillment companies. They will literally, you, know, you just direct any of your deliverables, products, et cetera, to them and then they'll package them and then send them off to your backers list. So yeah, there, there's, there's ways to remove that because yeah, it became a full-time job for about I don't know, a couple of weeks and just signing yeah. books alone. I don't think like, you get carpal tunnel syndrome, like it's good times. Yeah. Almost worth investing in a stamp, but that seems, that seems not as cool. You know, you want to actually sign them. Oh, but also you, you sign enough books, your signature, your signature starts changing and then you get a little bit self-conscious and you're like, what is my name anymore? So yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it is actually recommended that you change your signature up for book signing anyway, so that you're not just handing people the thing that you sign credit card receipts with and stuff. Yeah, no, you got to make it a little bit more fancy. <laughs> I skipped all that and just started giving people credit card receipts that I'd sign <laughs> instead of when they ask me for an autograph, I just give them a credit card receipt. Hey, sweet. I mean, if you have enough money in your account that you won't notice when a bit goes missing, I guess you can get away with that. <laughs> just using. Um, uh, yeah, cut out the middleman. Uh, okay. So we've talked about that. Um, just I, I've in, got a in, question. I don't know if this is a question yeah. you want uh, answered, but um, Barbara Marshall on Twitter was, because uh, I said, anybody got any questions in case oh, we sorry. had uh, any need for it? And she's asking, what advice do you have for filmmakers, showrunners, producers who are adapting mm -hmm. a novelist's work, do's and don'ts? And it's actually a good question because I've never, I have so many people asking about like what, uh, what did what should the authors try to do or get or how should they behave or expect and everything? But I'm the, I'm, I'm assuming that she's on the pr production side and mm. I've never heard anyone in Hollywood care two cents worth of what an author needs or wants. So um, it's that cool is a cool so much, question. Yeah, so it's cool. So much, I was so about more. to switch to asking you about what you've been up to lately, um, and so we oh, can just we can, we can slide right in. Yeah. Um, so yeah. 
too. Tell us a little bit about what you've been doing the last couple of weeks. Uh, well, uh, we were joking about this before we went on the air that, uh, well, the, the big thing I'm dealing with is uh, the Silo series um, is uh, filming in uh, London right now. So, yeah, I got to go visit, walk around sets and meet cast and crew and watch some uh, some dailies being shot and stuff. And it was really insane and intense. Um, and uh, yeah, got to keep you off that topic or I'll just talk about that forever. <laughs> um, so here's a question. Is that, I uh, just to clarify for everyone watching at home. So um, the Silo Saga is being adapted TV film. TV, uh, TV, Apple, Apple TV, Apple TV. Uh, it's Apple and AMC kind of working together. Okay. Which is interesting. And, um, and yeah, so you, you were in the UK to watch all that stuff and what input do you have? I mean, keeping in mind that like, I know mo for most authors, if you get movie rights optioned or whatever, usually that's it, right? Like your story goes off and you pretty much have zero input in what happens. Um, you got to go to the UK and see all this. So presumably you're getting a little more input than that. Um, what's that? Yeah, like? uh, well, so this one I had quite a bit where um, we adapted it together. Like um, right. I'm an executive producer on it. So I was uh, in the room with the showrunner and the writers as we blocked out the uh, the seasons roughly, then the 10 episodes of the first season um, with all the story beats. And then the first episode was super detailed, like every every beat. And uh, that helped figure out what, how to tell the show, uh, um, which uh, it's amazing how many like considerations go into how many locations can you get away with? Which characters should you combine to reduce the size of the cast and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of like, uh, like more Hollywood bean counting stuff that goes on in writer's rooms than I would have uh, thought. Uh, mm. and, that's, and that's with something that the budget on this is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, it's basically, uh, uh, and I've talked to people who worked on both shows, uh, Game of Thrones and working on this and the budgets are about the same. So. Uh, it's it's just crazy, but even then, everyone's always just talking about how you could save a little money and get rid of a, a setting. Because um, so, you can spend infinitely if you don't yeah. try to at least do yeah. that. Right? Like it's, yeah, you can you can build the you can build the silo if you want to spend you know billions of dollars on it. Um, uh, <laughs> so and then lots of um, notes. I've been you know reading scripts for uh, over a year now and and just writing detailed notes on everything and seeing a lot of that incorporated as new revisions come in and getting on meetings where we're trying to like parse out the action of a very specific scene. And that's really cool because they're showing storyboard art of every mm -hmm. shot that's going to be taken. And so you're getting to see it as a, as a kid who grew up on comics, like I'm getting to watch basically a, com a comic book version of this narrated by the director and showrunner as we're walking through scene by scene and take by take and trying to figure out how to, move the camera and the action to make it uh, as riveting as possible. Nice. Um, yeah, so I've had like the perfect level of involvement where if it's bad, I don't have to take any of the uh, blame. Credit. <laughs> if it's good, I can take all the credit. So nice. uh, it's that middle ground. Sweet. So circling back to Barbara's question from Twitter, what is important to you? I mean, like, okay, nice. You're in the perfect sweet spot of, of not being too responsible, but also having control. But what are the most important things to you to get right in the show? Like what, yeah. what matters most? That's a great question. I think um, I've had, so this is like the fifth or sixth uh, work that I've gone into some level of production with a partner. And I think the, the most enjoyable thing is sitting down and talking about the work with people who are thinking about adapting it for different medium. And that's where you really get to drill into what's important about the story to you, what, like what's the heart of the story and what can't change without it. Why, why even adapt this? Why are you choosing this material if, if it's not uh, because of this uh, kernel of truth or this certain character and their struggle at the heart of it? Um, and I think you find that out before you even sign the paper uh, to, to option your work. You have to have that in common. Mm. And for me, the biggest thing is I don't want someone to say I'm adapting this person's work 
for TV or film. I want someone to come in and say, um, love your story. Let's create an amazing version of this together. Uh, I want to hear that their creativity and their, uh, like they, that the story gets their juices flowing and they're like, but what if we mm. did this? So I'm doing another project with uh, Zach Penn at the helm, who I've been a fan of his material for so long. He wrote uh, The Last Action Hero uh, okay. when he was practically a teenager. It really got him on the scene and he wrote the adaptation of Ready Player One. Okay. Uh, he worked on uh, Free Guy. He helped write Free Guy, which was, I thought, fantastic. Um, so uh, he's adapting this book of mine, Beacon 23. And, and one of the first things she did was say, what if this? And it was a huge mm -hmm. departure, a big twist. And I immediately just fell in love with this idea. And I, it made me wish I could go back and rewrite the book so I could incorporate oh, it. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's massive. It changes everything. Um, That's cool. But it doesn't change important things. And hmm. I love that because now I know that now Zach, this is as much his creation as mine, hmm. which means that he's getting up every morning, living in the world and wanting to develop it uh, and make it as detailed and true as possible because he's not working for me. He's creating something of his own. Nice. And I think authors who are too protective of their work, it, that's, hmm that probably keeps things from getting pushed forward to the next level because uh, it, it's not allowing someone's passion to mm. become some of the fuel there. And we were joking before we went live, uh, Duncan was like laughing at me for having like two shows going into production in the same year. And I just learned that uh, Beacon 23 might be filming late this year up in Toronto, like through Twitter, like no one, on the production <laughs> side. So talking about different varying levels of like involvement. I was in the writer's room for Beacon 23 as well. And I've been reading scripts, but- But they just uh, up the schedule. <laughs> yeah, well, no, they, they don't need me in order to actually shoot the thing. So mm. uh, um, I'm the last to find out certain things. Right. Like we just cast uh, the lead in it and I found nice. out on Twitter. So it's, I think it's kind of fun <laughs> to be out of the loop on some things, you know? Yeah, that's cool. Um, very exciting stuff on, on all fronts and, um, makes one wonder how, uh, either of you have time for, for running a contest. Um, but I love that you just were like, oh yeah, sure. We'll do that too. Um, <laughs> to be fair, it's like 98%, uh, Duncan and 2% somebody else probably. Uh, the level <laughs> you're just of work the that, you're like, hey. and all the all the <laughs> bloggers and people like yourself like you worked hard to get us on and to put this together so uh i i i'm doing stuff like buying ray guns and coming up with artwork and like financing a few little making badges yeah and exactly <laughs> so and mailing them to people i'm superfluous at this point like y'all get rid of me at the thing like hum, to hum be long fair, i feel i feel superfluous as, as well i mean all i really did was this <laughs> push you in front of the bus and say, hey, you're doing this with me. Um, and then manage to find 59 reviewers who basically do all the heavy lifting. Um, it is now all on the reviewers. Yeah, that is. Um, it's, it's, well, yeah, there's, I mean, I'm a bit of a bottleneck in terms of kind right. of getting results out and then putting them in presentable formats. Because um, <laughs> at the moment, we just ran the cover contest. So I need to basically collate that and, and stick right. in the format people can view. So I'm a I'm a bit of a bottleneck there, but workplay wise, like I'm not, I'm not doing the the reading or the reviews. Um, it's not my forte per se, and I'm, I'm, I'm more just trying to, trying to herd cats sometimes, because um, 59, 59 reviewers all tend to do their own thing sometimes, and just yeah, uh, yeah. It's the only real, the only real unwieldy crew workload has been how do you communicate with that many people, and then set the framework and then like build a website. So we've, we've been very lucky in, in the number of people that have put their hand up to basically help me do these things. Cause yeah. I, I don't have the time to do them all. Um, no. And I also didn't quite understand the, the scope of some of them when I first said, yeah, we can do this, but then you need, you know, you, you need a website, but you, mm. need, you need to build a website and then it needs to, you need to debug the website, which we didn't necessarily do before going live. So you, you learn pieces <laughs> as we've gone. <laughs> There's been a few teething pains, but I mean, yeah, workload wise, like I feel like the the real heavy lifting is kind of behind us now, and now mm. we're fine tuning um, this beast that we've created, and it, it should by next year, but now you know, be self sustaining. We know what we're doing. We've got a process in place, and and right. the, the kinks have been ironed out. So yeah, it's it's more like the real heavy stuff was getting people on board and getting the word out and getting the authors in and getting their applications sorted. And, 
the application um, sorting seemed like it was a, a lot of work, which is well, awesome. Yeah, and, that, and that's the thing as well. Like we didn't have, we, we, we stole the model and the idea with blessing from our clients from Spitfire, but we didn't have a framework to use for it. And we didn't have guidelines. We didn't have, we, I mean, we didn't even have a time schedule. So right. any any date that we basically came up with has been has been a, an estimate and a, and, a, and a ballpark kind of we think it might take a month to do this and then right. we find out in process a we could do it in a week yeah actually, or it takes three months like it's so it's it's kind of organic and in, in in limbo in some aspects at the moment but by next year we'll be nailed down quite nicely I think. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I have to say, so this is the first time I've been a reviewer for a competition like this. I have participated as an author in two Spitfos now, but um, it's the first time being on the review side of things. And it's interesting to see how much work goes into it. And from the reviewers I've talked to who do both contests, um, and there are quite a few who, who overlap yeah, yeah. and do, do both contests, um, it sounds as though um, the way that that space fig is run is is different in terms of that organization of the blogs in terms of everybody reading all the entries for each group and stuff um and i as a as an author i love that um i love that the that all the all the the whole team is gonna take a look at the t first 10 to 20 percent of all those books and then it's going to be more of a group vote um because the way it runs in spiffo is different and yeah, yeah. Um, and lends itself a little bit more to reader bias. Um, yeah, and that's what we're kind of, when I, when I started reading more, or at least asking reviewers, the, the nature of how they culled their, their slush pile um, was a little bit more open to subject, subjective bias. And I was like, it's, I, how do you work around, A, you've got 300 books, but say you've got 10 teams, which is what both competitions have. Yeah. You wanted to give each team 30 books, because that seems almost manageable, but you want to make sure that the maximum number of eyes are on each book so that it doesn't get you know, it, three people love it and two people hate it, um, and it beats a book that four people love and one person hates. You, know, it's, right. you, you wanted to get as many eyes as possible to get a fair judgment of should the book proceed to the next round, so that every, all the other teams can have a viewpoint on it as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we needed a bit more. I mean, structure just in, in, in the culling process to get us from um, three hundred down to a hundred, and then down to thirty, and down to the final yeah. ten. Totally. It also helps preventing, you know, sometimes you, you read a book and it's not for you, but you know yeah. other people will love it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and some weird things that can turn some people off, like what uh, tense or what uh, person um, a book is written in. Like some language, people use of language. Yeah, like, exactly. Kind of a lot of people, uh, yeah. content, some people find incredibly stressful. And, and, totally. Um, and, and others are like, no, that's that's the only kind of book that I read. So yeah, it, it's hard to a, ensure that you're not going to penalize a book just because it was assigned to judge group A and not judge group B. Right. I, I personally mo mostly prefer science fiction that takes place on Earth, not in space, which is mm. why I cannot hear pronounced space fic anymore. Um, <laughs> it, none of my fiction takes place there. So I, I just think, you know, you're disqualifying me, basically. <laughs> it's, it's specific. Well, what about liminal space, though? That space sort of between oh, gosh, I guess reality Earth is and fiction. In space. Yeah. I don't know. Earth is definitely in space. Yeah. <laughs> Fake news. The world is flat. What are you talking about? Uh, look, it's okay. We all have our biases. Mm. You know, you're very, if you're very earthbound, Hugh, that's fine. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, no, I mean, like, uh, yeah, I, I get it. The, there is, there's something very appealing about, you know, dystopian or far future or whatever Earth settings. Um, but yeah, I also like space. I, I like both. Um, but I, I, I was just gonna actually have a lot of a lot of science fiction <laughs> that takes place in space. <laughs> Um, um, I'm trying to make this. So we've got some questions time. rolling in. We've got some questions rolling in about SPSFC um, mm -hmm. in the 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 YouTube chat. Sorry, my brain just failed me for a moment there. I have not for had sure. this big coffee. Mm -hmm. um, but I am going to read us a couple of those and uh, see what we've got. All right. Um, we've got. Will there be different readers, judges each year, or mostly the same people? Do you think? I think it just depends. Um, I mean, we'd love to have this, the, 
the same people, same reviewers, judges come back next year. Mm -hmm. um, there's always room for a little bit more. Uh, we have 10 teams. Uh, we kind of had maybe a possible cap of 10 members per team. Um, just that it's manageable. I mean, 100 reviewers is a rather significant force to kind of try, corral and, and arrange and organize. Um, but as, like you said yourself, I mean, with Swiftbo, a lot of the judges' teams, they're repeat judges. They come back multiple times. They've been doing it for six years straight. Um, mm -hmm. And now a lot of them are also judging space, specific space force, my God. So yeah, it would be great to have them return. Um, and it'd be lovely to have, uh, obviously new authors, but authors maybe should, should submit a second, a second book next year, et cetera. So, I mean, yeah, the, the, the return, the return guest is what we're basically after. I, I, <laughs> I hope the only reviewers we lose are disqualifying themselves by writing their own works and entering them into the competition. Uh, yeah. I, I started as a book blogger and reviewer and writing the reviews every day got me in the constant habit of writing and reading so many books got me um, absorbing enough uh, structure and figuring out, you know, having to critique it made me read differently, which made me start priming myself to be a writer. Hmm. And then doing interviews with authors and doing stuff like you like just chatting now and realizing that, um, uh, th they're as normal as I am, which is not very normal, but, um, it actually, uh, made me feel like this is something I could do as well. So my, my writing career would not have ever happened had I not started as a book reviewer and a blogger. Uh, it'd be great if we lost a couple every year to, uh, sure. while they're, while they're doing this and getting excited about it, they start really pushing forward some of the projects that they've been putting aside and not finishing. Uh, but otherwise, I think bringing back the same uh, has a lot of advantages, bringing back the same team. But we could have probably used a few more uh, to fill, flush out every single of the 10 teams. And if we had a mm -hmm. couple of people who are watching this or hear about this and, and are excited about helping discover new works, we'd love to have you involved next year. So mm -hmm. hopefully it's a good, a good mix of, of all of that. Um, awesome. So that I think that covers that question. Um, question for both of you, because uh, I didn't actually establish this beforehand. How are you for time? Are you good for another like 20, 30 minutes? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah we're good. My, no? my, wife's, my wife's out with a two-year-old, so I've got the house to myself. So okay. I can't right. promise much more after that. We might have chaos and noise. And, <laughs> okay. And, and, and a little uh, interloper, but yeah, I'm good. All right. So um, we'll do one more audience question. Uh, that is a general self-publishing question. Um, M. Lynch asks, self-publishing allows writers to jump from genre to genre and even dabble in the main in mainstream fiction if they like, but how much harder do you think that makes it to find a readership? That's a really good question. That's the, that's the kind of question you really wrestle with when you're starting off your career and do you keep writing sequels to mm. your first book? Do you How much do you branch out and should you use pen names or should you consolidate? your marketing behind one identity. Um, I've, you know, only had the experience of just my own career, but I'm, I've written in so many different genres, um, romance, sci-fi, young adult, children's picture books, horror, um, uh, very like literary stuff. Um, I and your career's going okay, so. It's going okay, but like some, of the, some things sell and some things don't, but right. uh, I, I would not have, written the thing that sells well had I not taken a departure from my if I if my first book series had done well with a, a medium-sized publisher they would have just kept me writing the same thing if I would have turned in wool they would have said this is darker and mm, a little yeah. too and dystopia and you write you write young adult space right. opera stick with what you have like right they're they're just so um they have such blinders on publishers right. in general when they come to how adventurous readers will be Mm -hmm. and what I what I found personally is that people who enjoy uh, the writing, uh, you know, one author's voice will enjoy reading them across genres. And I've done that for my own reading, where if I find someone I really like, um, no matter what they write, I really get into. Um, so I think my gut feeling is that you should not spread yourself uh, thin by having multiple pen names and, yeah. and whatnot, mm -hmm. consolidate under one banner. And I also think you should take more risks with what style of writing, what genre you write in, because you're not going to discover what you're great at and what readers are 
enjoying from you if you're not experimenting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, write broadly, but consolidate um, your marketing efforts mm. around one identity, which is yourself, you know, as much as possible in yeah. self-marketing, I think just convincing people to be themselves and be, make themselves vulnerable to uh, criticism and to mm. uh, interaction with the readers uh, that that's, I not only work for me, but I've seen it work for a lot of other authors as well. Totally. I've actually, the number of authors I've picked up their stuff because I was already following them on Twitter or something and I enjoyed stuff they were saying and tweeting and whatever. And then eventually I was like, maybe I should check out their books and then discovered like that I love their work. Um, it's not an inconsiderable number. Like it's like- Same. I, I, so <laughs> one of the, one of the um, commenters on YouTube, EJ Moore is actually a writer who's mm. I fall in love with her writing from Twitter. She writes these oh, yeah. like uh, entire stories and within the tw 240 characters that she's allotted. Yeah. And every one of them is like, ah, I want the whole novel of this. And so when she announced uh, pre-orders for a book recently, it was like zero hesitation. I, <laughs> I get a thrill out of every little short that she uh, writes and I just, I'm always wanting more. And so she's done a really good job of, putting her writing talent on display in a public mm. way. And instead of begging people to buy my book, showing you why you should want uh, to right. buy her book. And that works on me. Yeah, totally. Um, also just people being nice and or funny on the internet works for me too. Like, uh, and help, you know, just being helpful. I think V. E. Schwab is an author who I had never read any of her stuff until I was just sort of following her this way earlier on in my career for writing advice and, just to get another perspective on how people's processes work. And um, and then after a while, I was like, gosh, I should check out her books. And I freaking love her books. Like I've now read everything she's written. Um, and that's true of a few other people as well. So, um, but it's all, it's always that. It's always just like regular human interaction and not buy my book um, that sells me books. Yeah. Buy my um, book, you know, like. It's old very fast. Yeah, exactly. You know it's, different. it's just like, here's a thing I did. Everybody yeah. can see it, right? Like that's, that's totally fine. But the like, rah, rah, buy this, buy this, that, that yeah, that doesn't really. You know, when, where it does work, and this is what I think happened with um, my short story, Wool, why it took off is mm. if, if someone's out there saying, buy my book, it, that doesn't work. If someone's out there saying, buy this other person's book, that works more than anything else in the world for selling books. <laughs> That's like, the only reason I buy books. Exactly. And <laughs> reader word of mouth. Um, so like, I think I've probably gotten more readers by suggesting someone else's book than I have by suggesting my own books. And matter right. of fact, when, when people find out I'm a writer, which they usually have to kind of draw out of me, I'm not uh, quick to let people know in, in public when, I'm, when I meet people, like when they ask me like, what you do. Um, do you just say you're a sailor? What's your, I, what's well, your... I used to say that, yeah, that I'm <laughs> yeah. just retired and I travel yeah. and, um, you know, looking for the next thing. Yeah. Um, but if they find out I'm a writer, they're like, what should I read? I'm like, oh, you should read uh, Colson Whitehead's new book. It's amazing. Like, they always assume <laughs> I'm going to like, like, I know they're they asking are. me, but I, I'm, I don't want to suggest my own stuff. Like, that's mm -hmm. up to other people to suggest. And I think I had that attitude as a bookseller. For years, I was working mm -hmm. in a bookstore while my books were self-published. And on the bookstore shelf only that I was working in. No other bookstore would touch <laughs> Right, them. just the one that you could shove them on. <laughs> yeah, and when people would find out, like having come to the bookstore many times or professors who worked on campus would find out that I was published and I had never mentioned to them that I was published, they bought a book immediately. They were like, why haven't you been telling me? Like, what are you holding? What are you keeping from me? And I found out consistently work that if, <laughs> if people have to dig it out of you that you've written a book, mm -hmm. they're like, I'm, of course I want to read this now. If you tell someone you've written a book, they're like, I don't, I'm never talking to that person ever again because I'm just <laughs> terrified they're going to make me read the damn thing. So it's, it's I know it's counterintuitive, yeah. but it's like you have to um, trust in other people to spread word of mouth about your works while you're doing that for other people's works. Yeah. Um, and that really like, especially the, the helping out other people by like, by actually reading and recommending their stuff though. I find it also doesn't really work to just be like, oh, you should totally buy this person's thing. Cause they're my friend. Um, you know, that's nice. But, but when you've actually read the book and can recommend it, especially if you can make comparisons and stuff, that's really useful. Mm -hmm. And then I think people start to trust you 
the, you know, that you're recommending things based on actual like, and also then, you know, the people who you're helping, you're actually helping. So readers trust you and then more of them look to you for advice. And anyway, I don't know. I think that always works out better than just and being. You get to take uh, full credit for the success of their careers afterwards. <laughs> exactly. You can pretend you're the only one suggesting the works. I, I, that. I, That's yeah, I, I tell everyone to like read Lexicon <laughs> by Max Berry uh, <laughs> when it came out, I just fell in love with this book. And then his career took off and I was like, that's because of me. And then yeah. I meet all these other people who are also suggesting his books to everyone else. I'm like, hey, that's my turf. What are you doing? <laughs> that's what I do. I that's recommend. my guy. <laughs> You've got to get um, a de dedication in his next one then. <laughs> yeah. Well, truth. But this is all thanks to, to Hugh. Hugh Howie is, for my yeah, exactly. Hugh Howie. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. Okay. So uh, there are a couple of questions that are just for Hugh about filming stuff, which we'll get back to if we have time, but I think we'll want to stick to, to space fic related things for a little bit. Yeah. Um, okay. So we already talked about the basics that everyone needs to know. Um, I think we've also kind of talked about what you're most excited about, which is really just spreading the word about new authors that people haven't necessarily heard of. At least that's the message that I've gotten from our, our, our time talking so far. Mm. Also that, I don't I'm know. Excited about, I'm excited about giving this to somebody. Yeah, yeah. I want one. And seeing it on their, <laughs> on their shelf. Um, it's I, like this, a the, chunky ray gun too. It is so chunky and heavy. This is like <laughs> a solid like pewter or something and steel. But the smartest thing I did was get this like uh, and as soon as we announced we were doing a competition and that gives me a whole year of holding on to this. <laughs> you just it. get to play with it. So then yeah. whoever wins it gets to like, be like, oh my gosh, Hugh Howie held this gun for a year. <laughs> yeah, I'm never it. washing this gun again. Oh no, you're gonna, you, this is like all my COVID breath and everything that's been on this. Like you have to uh, sterilize The this. winner has to lick the ray gun. Oh in geez. A selfie geez, and then we'll start the next <laughs> pandemic. Let's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it'll be fun to see how how everything has evolved um, in your special uh, germs. Uh, a number of people have commented that the ray gun is super cool. By the way, in in the YouTube mm. chat. Um. Okay. So so yeah. So it, did I? I mean, I assumed the things that you're excited about. But is there anything else you want to add about excitement? The ray gun is amazing. Um, just shining a light on on indie authors who are writing sci-fi is amazing. Is there anything else that you're super stoked about with this competition? Or my I'm thing. super stoked about finding a whole bunch of new books to read yeah. that I don't necessarily have to go looking for and have already been peer reviewed, suggested by people that I trust and whose, whose advice I generally follow anyway. It's, um, it's most of the reviewers I'm now following and have been following before this competition. And they're my main source of books or at least new suggestions. So yeah, I'm really excited about knowing what to download next because i do struggle with that i tend to reread books that i liked purely because i can't find a new book that gives me the same that same scratches thing. that itch mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and then also as an author i like to reread books that i like to try work at why i liked it um so no i'm, I'm excited about finding a bunch of new guys and I, I there's already i think two or three that are on my radar that i've downloaded one of them um, and i'll probably pick up a few more so uh, and then also just seeing what just seeing what happens like does you know, does this change somebody's life? And if so, how? And, mm. and, and being part of that and then getting to do it next year. And I'm excited about doing it next year more than this year because we've learned so much um, that I can only get better in my mind. Awesome. You? I, I agree with that. And I think um, even like longer term, it's going to be fun when we're like um, the fantasy competition and we're on our seventh or eighth year mm -hmm. and um right. you've just developing these relationships and uh these connections and the inside jokes that will come and uh the friendships that will form i uh maybe it's because we've been cooped up for so long but i can't wait to be going back to book conferences and bumping into people that we've known through email and and working on this together for yeah. years i mean this is looking way down the road but uh, it's just going to be cool to have those connections and those friendships that I, I know will come out of this. I've only ever been to one book conference, and that was about a month before COVID hit, and that was my first book conference. So I have no concept at all about book conference, conferences in general. So yeah, it'd be nice to have an SPSFC table at one one day. 
little SPSFC reunions everywhere too. Yeah, why not? Um, yeah, certainly I got to say the community I got out of entering Spiffbo and being, especially being a finalist, like I, my best friends now, because I don't see humans in real life anymore, are the nine other finalists from the 2019 SPFBO. Like those people I talk to every day, we check in with each other and like, Except yeah, for and- whoever won. No, no, no she's the best. I love, like, <laughs> I actually, so I just did a road trip. I just saw real humans uh, in the wild for the first time ages, like in, in a year and a half, just like two, a week, at a, a week ago, week and a half ago. Anyway, and I stayed, uh, Emma Long is uh, one of the finalists. She's the one who won. And I totally slept on her couch twice, on, once on the way out and once on the way back. Um, awesome. She's delightful. She's one of the best humans I've ever met. And um, she has a really adorable bird. Uh, named Sulu, um, who we should totally adopt as a mascot because obviously his name is Sulu. And so he's very appropriate to any sci-fi competition. Um, But yeah, like that community is just amazing. Like I love, I love that. And I, I sincerely hope that we, you know, get that community going for the authors who have entered. Certainly it seems like we're already developing a reviewer community, which is amazing as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the discord that Duncan set up is perfect for all that stuff, but like, I I kind of even keep track, keep up with the the discord, the author chat just. (laughs) Yeah. I just goes. I I think crashing at each other's places is great. Like one time Duncan's going to be doing uh, some kind of zoom, um, interview and i'm going to pop up in that uh bed behind him like just he will covers, be dressed he will be the dressed. covers fold back and i'm like hey are we, are we on are we live <laughs> that's, the level, short. that's the level of family and comfort i'm looking for mm. absolutely hey you're both welcome if you're ever in winnipeg <laughs> we got a guest room that you're welcome to ca- crash in if the i might have a show like- i might have a show that's filming there right now and i wouldn't even know that's you could there's and there are actually a lot of shows that film here and in fact my husband works in the film industry here so um so we would know um i can tell you that none of your books are currently filming here i don't think man (laughs) it's funny like once you get two going you just like why why are all my books being developed right you just get really entitled yeah there you go (laughs) i would say they should they should film sand here but there's like only one location in the entire province that would be appropriate and it's very small (laughs) <laughs> uh, and then people are like, um, I'm, I'm like, oh my God, Wool and Beacon 23 are like getting made in TV shows now. And I was even a comment today. And like, uh, I want I really want to see Sand. I'm like, you can't. So does Hugh. So does Hugh. Yeah, so do I. Like, you can't please everyone. Like, oh, these, yeah, yeah. these aren't the two that I want to see. Get like, on it, people. Did it, yeah. You did it all wrong. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't get to choose any of this stuff. I know. Well, it's uh, hopefully we're putting it out there. If there are any producers watching, um, Sand would be a great thing. There are people who want to see it, including Hugh. So or let, let's look at the let's look at the ten finalists of this competition and try to get them all to get some kind of film and TV option. That would, oh yeah, it's, I mean that's that's like that. the 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 holy grail of outcomes for somebody. You know, That'd be amazing. Who's getting noticed and picked up? So yeah, that's. I mean, we can't offer that as a given, but it'd be lovely if it happened. Yeah. That would be lovely. Yeah, that's not a that's not like a thing you can guarantee. It's not a prize we hand out. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I like I'm. I think it's. I think it's smart for any of us who have agents or no people producers are looking for things. Uh, mm-hmm. Everyone wants to snatch up something before mm-hmm. um, before it gets too big they can't afford it. So I'm <laughs> definitely when we get those ten finalists, I'm definitely sending a list off to anybody that I know to try to um, help get someone. You know a deal yeah. uh and, and i've talked about this extensively but like even if you get option and nothing else ever happens like that's a thrill and a victory all on its own and and uh sure. i hope that can happen to a lot of the people who are involved in specific space force <laughs> and, and i'm sorry did you say space force? And, <laughs> and scene and yeah go to black and that's the last thing people yeah. that's the last well, last word you win the last word is specific coming up <laughs> Ins call. (laughs) 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 Mic drop. Um, So the only other question uh, so far, um, well, there that is directly related to space fic, is um, when is the competition going to be over? Which um, I know, I think we're a little like we're guesstimating time periods, right? Like. Mm There's a timeline for the person who asked. There's a timeline on the yeah. website that's linked in the description. Please feel free to check that out just which, in case Duncan and you can't think of it. Which I am updating as we kind of go mm-hmm. along because, yeah, we, we set guidelines and some of them are hitting early and some are going over time. So I'm updating the date ranges. But basically, I mean, it's, it's the, it's the Swiftboy model where it's a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and in terms of re- reviews, we're actually about, 
I think a month and a half ahead of schedule because some of the teams just don't still write it because not they're awesome. Yeah, awesome. they're awesome. Yeah. And apparently they they just somebody somebody in the Discord chat the other day was telling me, was it you? No. Somebody's telling me to read two five hundred page books a day. Wow. Yeah. And I, I I can't comprehend that. But Listen. yeah, a lot of a, a few I think there's one or two teams that have basically finished their allocation of their 30. Wow. And now they're waiting for the other teams to catch up, although they're they're bordering on touching, not bordering on finished. Um, but yeah, it's a, the second half of the competition is going to be a bit more intense because that's when each team then has to read the entirety of every book that they're given, yeah. short of, of DNFing it, which is did not right. finish, etc. Um, and that that I'm not sure how we'll go. I mean, we've got extra time because we're ahead of the curve now. But yeah, the idea is a year, right. um, and then we use the last month. To just kind of pad the timing and also just correlate the results and put them in a nice yeah. format and, and make sure that we haven't screwed up somewhere along the line. Always and, good. I, yeah, and I think we have, if we have extra time in the end. We're going to do as much stuff like this as possible and mm. get, just, um, you know, any blogger who wants to do a talk and get the author on and pick their yeah. brain about the book. Like the more, more conversation, the more PR, more marketing stuff we put out there, that's all better. just yeah. easy to do, better. Yeah. So. Um, corn con always has a panel always we've run for two years and we always as is tradition though yeah exactly um uh always have a panel of all the spiffbo finalists so mm. we've done that twice now and we'll do it again if uh when we run again in the spring and we would be very happy to have a panel with all of the specific panelists or t- finalists as well so all 10 of them um awesome. we'd love to do that. So uh, we'll, we volunteer for one thing anyway, um, if they're interested. Um, yeah, so, um, but yeah, hopefully stuff like that will get snowballing. Well, yeah, I um, think it will, as we go along, we'll get more, you know, just, just as the word gets out, we'll, it'll snowball, like you said, and just we'll get more, more word of mouth spreading and more buy-in. And that's why I'm also very interested and excited about next year, because we'll have this basis to launch from as opposed to being, you know, an unknown, entirely unmarketed competition. Yeah. Um, well, the whole thing is pretty cool. Okay, I feel like we should start wrapping up. Um, I will say, um, I have one question that I think, well, no, okay. I have two more questions that I think I'd like to do quickly if we can. Sure. Um, do you have any notes to any entrants who might be watching? Any suggestions for how they should handle the stress of entering their books in a competition like this? Enter and then start writing your next book. Don't, hey. don't like yeah. that. Uh, that's just general advice to all that I would give to all writers who are just getting started is like the best marketing and promotion you can do is to write another work. So um, submit it and forget it, you know, um, start dreaming about the next world and live, live in that, that happy place that makes you like want to create a new fiction and start thinking about the entrance uh, for, for next year. Yeah. But um, yeah, like you just, you can drive yourself crazy. Like, have they read it yet? When's the review coming out? Yeah. Um, don't, don't, don't do any of that. You've done, you've there's nothing you can control now, like uh, start working on, on the next yeah, one. I think the only two pieces of advice, advice I would have, which, not just competition related, but author related is it's patience um, mm-hmm. and be kind in how you interact with people that you've asked to read your book. Um, be polite. It's amazing that has to be said, but it's, like, but I, yeah. And that's the thing because we've seen, we've had a few and in, in some instances they're, they're justified in their, their displeasure and others were, were somewhat taken aback by the vitriol because in, from, from the reviewer's perspective, they're going to remember you when you come back next year, et cetera, or the year after, not even competition related, just in, in book publication and say, now, do you want to read book number two, even though I called you a bunch of terrible names when book number one came out? And you're going to find that most reviewers carry a grudge or at least remember <laughs> your name. So yeah, just be patient with the process and not just competition. If you've asked somebody to read your book, don't hound them for it. I mean, yeah. they'll read it in their own time or they won't. Um, and if they, don't read it or don't publish a review i mean either they, they have other things in their life going on or they didn't necessarily like it and they, they don't want to hurt you um being one angry the, about it isn't going to help yeah one of the greatest gifts a reviewer can give an author is not publishing a bad review mm. um 
I, when I when I read something, when I was a, a book uh, reviewer for, a, I I read a lot of books and I published reviews of the ones that I loved. What what value did it give anyone to say, hey, here's a book you've never heard of, don't read it. It's like that's yeah. a waste of everybody's time, and it's not fair to the author who might have caught me on a bad day or is the wrong reader. So, yeah. in general, like review the best reviewers are the ones who spread enthusiasm about the things they like and are quiet yeah. about the things they don't like. Yeah. And yeah. I think if you're a reader and you know someone's read your book and you're like, why haven't you said anything? Um, why are you why are you even asking that question? Like, don't, don't, I, poke, I, don't, don't poke exactly. I have so yeah. many friends and family members and people who know that I write books and if they never say to me like hey I, I really love wool I don't go ask them like have you read have you read any of my books and what do you think about them like if, if they're not coming to me with something to say assume uh, <laughs> assume the worst yep. so yeah like just keep all interactions positive I say yeah and a reminder to to authors um all the reviewers are volunteering their time nobody's getting paid for this um and it's a lot of time because it's not just your book it's 30 other books just in that initial batch. And then it's m more books on top of that later. So please be kind to your viewers who are living their lives, working their full-time jobs, taking care of their families, and then trying to read your book for free on top of that and provide a review to help it out in this competition. So um, I feel like that's always good advice for authors, but especially any authors entered in a competition like this, um, the reviewers are doing their best to help you. And, um, yeah, it does. It pays to be polite. <laughs> um, okay, and then for readers, anyone who's watching this and going, man, I don't write science fiction, but I am stoked to read a bunch of science fiction. What do you want to tell them? Very start with question. start with Duncan's book. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the plug. Yeah. Start with Hughes. <laughs> start with Hughes because that's where this began. No, like look, when and people can read one book and I've read your entire. Uh, work, yeah, that's the problem. body of work. And so there you go. That's the problem with not there. having a, a catalog out yet. Is like, I need, I need to write faster. You have to start somewhere. But, you got to start yeah. somewhere. No, yeah. So read Monstre because it's one book, and then and then start on Hughes' catalog because it is lengthy but excellent. I have read all of the Wool Saga, all of the uh, Sand books, and um, and a couple of the Molly Fide books. I think. I got distracted after like book two or halfway through book three. And then I've been meaning to get back to them, but it's been a while. Um, I got distracted then... halfway through book five and haven't finished it yet. And keep telling readers <laughs> about it. So, well, so we're know, it right? happens. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> um, but, but Hugh's books are excellent. Um, read those. Uh, but I, I would say for readers of this competition, personally, the way I use the fantasy version of this competition is um, I check out all the semi-finalist uh, reviews ish I skim them because I hate spoilers I'm super spoiler averse and I like so many things are spoilers that people don't think of but um so I actually like to just sort of get a feel for whether or not a reviewer that I trust liked a book or not and that's as much as I'll read um and then just grab stuff based on what sounds good to me I'm a mood reader so if you're a reader and you're checking out the competition honestly you can start by judging things by their cover and see where that leads you. And then you can check out semi-finalists as they appear. And then uh, definitely check out all the finalists for sure, because that's gonna be 10 really solid books um, once we get to that point. And, but yeah, like depending on how fast you read, like there are some people who could read all 300 books that are entered in the competition, in which case go to town. <laughs> yeah. Um, in a single maybe, year, like I will, it will take next me next year. We'll just have one reviewer, we'll just have that one person who can read it all. <laughs> hey, at least everything would be <sighs> even then, <Yeah. laughs> all judged by the same measuring stick. Um, okay, so, uh, with those notes, I would say we're gonna get to our totally frivolous but always important final question, which is, um, if you could have any sci fi sidekick in your life in reality. Oh, what would it this is so and easy. Why? And this is okay. so easy. There's a, is, there, is, there a, is there another answer? It's got to be Chewbacca, right? Ooh, that is a solid answer. That is like, a very can fix anything. Only you know what he's talking about. It's like having, like, I'm, I love dogs. It's like owning a dog and you scratch them behind the back and no one's ever <laughs> messing with you. It's the ultimate bodyguard and they're loyal to a fault. Yeah. Except um, you're his dog because you die way sooner. Because because Wookiee's yeah, lived. Yeah, like, that's real cool with that. I'm cool with so, that. Yeah. You gotta have the Terminator. I'm sorry. 
Ooh. Oh, he's not a psychic. He can't be a psychic at the show. Well, but it's the psychic to you. Sorry, was it any character as a sidekick or any sidekick character? I just said any sci-fi sidekick, I leave it open to interpretation. Oh, okay. But I, I would have, I honestly was even mm. thinking of things like. I mean, if Han Solo could be my sidekick, then I'm up, I'm upgraded <laughs> from Chewbacca to her support. What, what did you go for Luke, then? You got the Force, man. Yeah, I go for Leia, Luke. personally. I think, Luke, I think Luke would get on your nerves after a while. <laughs> like, Luke's like that politician that you vote for because you know they might do a decent job. But you don't and, and then he disappears for 20 it. years anyway. Yeah, you don't right in public. Yeah. What I would actually want, though, is one of those really, like, super duper AI ships um, that that can, like, anticipate everything. Oof, I want, that's I want a one. great answer. Like, this, you're, the ship is your sidekick, and then you can go travel the stars. Wasn't, there was an Anne, was an Anne McCaffrey write a bunch of books about a thinking ship. The ship is saying. Is like one of them, I think. Mm-hmm. There's also the, I was actually thinking of the Ancillary series by Anne Leckie. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. freaking amazing books um and and i would love to hang out with that ai um so that would be my my choice i think all right um very last thing is there anything on either of your horizons that you would like to tell people about stuff coming up soon i mean tv shows and whatnot or are there any other new projects for writing are you working on monster a2 yeah yes. i'm, I'm yeah. on two um nice yeah it's i'm behind schedule i'm blaming covid but yes I'm, do yeah i'm blaming COVID, but yeah I'm, I'm 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 in the weeds trying to tighten it up and fix a few problems i hope um, you're gonna call them like monster today is the first one then monster and then monster rest <laughs> a female so monster more monster monstrous no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just sticking to volumes and, and my biggest battle at the moment is it because number volume two is looking to be absolutely enormous Mm. I work it if I have to split that, which then also creates more problems for me. So, um, serialize, serialize. Yeah, <laughs> it, it might be the simplest way because I mean, try Kindle Vela and see how it goes. Yeah, it, no, no, one volume one was one hundred and thirty thousand words. Two is already going to be over two, touching t- touching two twenty. So, I'm, chop it half. I need to chop it a little. Make, um, a, make a trilogy. I might, I might just. So yeah, that's my news, and then um, the only. Yeah, I've got a kid arriving in a month, so that's my other big news. So my life's going to get even busier. Quite. Yeah. Um, well, they, you're yeah. going to have as many kids as I have TV shows. Filming. Yeah, no. <laughs> that's crazy. The funny thing is, TV shows pay you. And, <laughs> no. um, and then um, I guess I guess the only last thing I'll do at the end is, is plug another author who's, I believe, self-pub. And if anybody wants to read an awesome book, uh, read the anti mematics division. Well, there is no anti mematics division. Okay. By Quantum, which is the weirdest author name I've ever seen. QNTM. I thought oh. that was a hell of a fun read. Cool. Me too. I, I will do the same and just say go read EJ Moore's Twitter feed and all of her short fiction and then pre order her new book. Um, I am dying. I can't believe with all the geeking out I do on her feed that she didn't send me like an advanced copy to. <laughs> Oh, promote, she's gonna hear like, that. She's watching. I'll just, right I'll here. just wait like she said else thank you earlier I'm when you referenced her, pre-order. and she was like, "Oh my god, thank you, you." So um, you'll have to watch the live chat playback later uh, because she's definitely watching, and she said thanks earlier for the reference. So um, definitely, uh, yeah, maybe you will find a copy on your doorstep in the next little while here. Um, but Hugh, I'm curious because just about your stuff, did you? Did you hint recently on the internet that you might be working on another book in the silo world? Yes, I've started another, uh, I, I, I'm thinking of it as a second trilogy, um, but we'll just see where it leads for now. It's, uh, it's the story of, of uh, a different silo that's hinted at in the Q&A yeah. of uh, the end of Wool. And uh, I've known what's happened in this story forever and uh it's fun finally putting it down on paper um and then we i've sent in final edits on the sequel to sand and working on uh cover art and interior art for that now i'm really excited that the publisher is splurging for uh, the interior art like we did with the first one Mm -hmm. uh well actually i i did like i um uh commissioned ben adams a uh artist, a New Zealand artist who's become a friend of mine uh, to do interior art. And they were like, we want to stick with that. Can we do more? So, you know, 
it's awesome. I get to work. Not only do I get to work with a friend for more illustrations, someone's and paying someone else- for like <laughs> illustrations that I get to enjoy. And then, oh, and a friend of mine is getting some more work. So he's getting like, uh, it's, I'm really, really thrilled with uh, HMH that they are, came through yeah. on that. And now we're repackaging um, the cover. Uh, also a friend of mine is getting to do the cover art for both books now. Mm. Uh, so we're in that fun phase of, I don't have to do any more writing, but I still get to be involved in the creative side. Yeah, the art is such an like undersung hero about a book. If and when you can leverage it, it's, it's, it's yeah. Which I think to be involved and lovely to see, but also just adds to the experience and the, and the quality and the content. Yeah, and I've always tried to like share the names of the people who are working mm-hmm. on stuff like this. Like Mike Corley, who's doing the cover art, uh, has done several of my books, and um, mm-hmm. I, I, I saw our badges. And our yeah, leaders. and he he gets work from other people because like you're vocal about who designed your stuff. I wish. And I'm glad we're doing the cover art competition separately from the interior because I just wish the that cover art and cover artists yeah. uh, all got more recognition. So mm-hmm. I, I, it's cool that we're highlighting that, celebrating that as part of Spacefic. Space Force. Space Fake. <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right. I, with that, I'm out of here. Like I, I said, I've, I've made my piece. Yeah. Definitely Spacefic. Well, we are we are wrapping up. I do want to thank you both so much for joining. Um, Pleasure. This Pleasure. was delightful. Thank you for coming to talk about the competition and yourselves. I hope that people watching it at home have have enjoyed it. I know I certainly have. Um, a couple corn con pieces just before we go to the audience at large. Please remember that you can buy corn con merch uh, off of our website through I think Zazzle and uh, t shirt. Teespring something anyway um, and all of that goes directly to funding things like this because I have to pay for a zoom account and a website and stuff and um, and those those purchases fund us directly so anyone who's watching please consider that also we have an anthology out um, we just released a small collection of short stories from the winners, the top three stories from our short fiction contest from 2020 and 2021, and put them both into one little book. It's only like 70 some odd pages long. It's very, it's short, Um, it's delightful. So please um, consider picking that up as well. Most of the proceeds from that go directly to the authors who are in it, um, but a small portion also goes to running Corn Con's cost as well. So that's a great way to support us and those awesome authors. Also, coming up October 22nd, we have an interview with Andrea Stewart, author of The Bone Shard Daughter. Um, So please add that to your watch list. Um, And I am really excited to talk to her and share that with all y'all. So again, thank you so much, Hugh and Duncan, for being here. Thank you for putting up with my little uh, spiel at the end there. Um, And uh, it's been really delightful talking to you. If anyone has more questions, um, hit up Hugh and Duncan on Twitter, maybe? Uh, we're on the twits all the time yeah sure <laughs> or not like he was like oh hit, we get enough questions anyway. <laughs> dm me <laughs> yeah there you go um and uh yeah and they will do their best to answer if i see any amazing questions that we somehow missed i will um, be sure to pass those along i will say hugh ej moore exclaimed omg of course i'll send one um in response <laughs> to <laughs> the <laughs> uh, also virginia you're you're amazing at this like you're <laughs> uh you're it's so great uh to chat with you live like this, but you do an amazing job putting this on. So I hope uh, a lot of the stuff that ends up happening with this going forward, you get to host more people and have some authors on. I'll watch anything you do. I think you're great at thanks. this. Thanks. Ah, thanks so much. It's a lot of fun. And I'm already like, I, it's amazing to be the number of people who say yes to coming on here. Um, like, yeah, I've talked to a lot of really amazing authors whose work I love and it's really, really fun to do. So, um, and I, today I got to add one more and, Eventually, Duncan, I will read your book too, although it's very dark, so it might have to wait until it is a bit dark. It's over. It is dark. So, yeah. I only read grim stuff when I'm feeling really like fluffy. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. Done. The world needs more dark. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, lots of people do. Lots of people do. It, it like it's it's a it's a spot that a lot of people it's a feeling that a lot of people enjoy. Um, mm-hmm. I can only I can only enjoy it when I'm in a better place than I am right now. So uh, it's gonna have to wait for me. But I, I am adding it to my shelf. Correct. Um 
but thank you again and thanks to everyone watching uh it's so delightful to have you all here we had a lot of people watching and commenting um i'm gonna i'm gonna go back through the chat and check out more of the comments and try to reply to people where i can uh, not in the chat because that'll go away but you know so again thanks so much i am now gonna just hit the in stream button and um everybody can wave smile and say goodbye let's catch you all later i don't know what to do with my hands <laughs> <laughs> okay i